In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I probably have mentioned him before. One of my, one of my favorite fictional literary characters is, is billed as a, uh, uh, an action hero, but he's really more of a, a fictional, or a, a thinking hero. No nonsense, retired soldier without a home. He's got very gruff and intimidating exterior, but he's got a soft heart. He's always looking to help those that need help. And in the, the story that I was just rereading recently, he, he crosses half of the country in order to, to find someone he's never met. But someone that he knows is, is distressed and in trouble and, and needs help. And when he gets asked by a fellow soldier why he'd be willing to do all of this, why he'd be put in this time and, and put his, his life on the line, put himself into the line of danger for someone he's never met, his, his answer was telling. His answer was simply, because she's one of us. Jesus had to go through Samaria, is, is what John tells us in, in, the, in the gospel. He had to go through Samaria. And it wasn't because Samaria was on a direct line between, um, between Judea in the south and Galilee in the north, though it was. Nobody wanted to go through Samaria because it was, it was the place where those foreigners, those, those yeah, second cousins once removed, lived. The people that we really don't like, though. You don't travel through Samaria, but, but Jesus had to go there. Because there was a woman, and that woman needed him. She was a woman who was in trouble. She was, she was lost, floundering, wandering around in a lifetime filled with bad decisions. And there, there was a, a whole town of people there who were, who were absolutely confused. And they were thirsty for water that would truly satisfy. Jesus had to go there because they needed to know. <laughs> they needed to know that salvation would come, not, not like some kind of magical charm or, or a spell from the Jewish people, but, but that salvation would come from the nation of Israel. That's what God had promised through through Abraham, through your descendants, I am going to bless the whole world. They needed to know that the Messiah would come from the people of Israel, that the Messiah had come. And if those disciples had enough guts to actually ask the question that was rattling around in their brains, you know, why are you, why are you talking to her? Be because in public, um, men wouldn't just generally talk to a woman whose husband wasn't there. They, they just wouldn't do this. And you certainly wouldn't find Jewish people speaking to Samaritan people. And so the last thing that you would ever expect is to find a Jewish man speaking to a Samaritan woman. And she even acknowledges that, doesn't she? If the disciples had the guts to ask that question of Jesus, what are you doing, Jesus? You shouldn't be talking to her. Why are we here? Why are you speaking to her? I wonder, I wonder if Jesus wouldn't have answered like my, my favorite fictional literary character. I wonder if Jesus wouldn't have just simply said, because she's one of mine. And I came for her too. Maybe you feel like that, that woman at Sychar, that woman at the well different times. Maybe, maybe you feel lost um, partly because of your lifetime that's been filled with some sketchy decisions. Maybe you, you feel this little bit of embarrassment at what your normal has become. Maybe you're somebody who, <laughs> who looks around and you see that there are so many people around you, relatives, people who seem to have everything figured out. 
They just have their life put together. It's all buttoned up. And you might present yourself like that in public, and and you certainly might seek to present yourself like that if you're on any kind of social media, because that's what everybody does on social media. You never put your problems there. You always put your successes, all the good things and, and the positive things. But you know better. It's not what you really like. You know that you're broken. You feel out of place around so many people that that seem to have so many things going so right for them. Believe me, nobody's got everything going right. But that's the way you feel. You feel out of place. You feel like you don't belong. Maybe you even feel like that when you come here into God's house. Maybe especially when you come here to God's house. I know that, that that some of you feel that way because you've you've told me that's how you feel. (laughs) But you're here at a good time. Whether you realize that or not, you are here at a good time because the season of Lent reminds us that Jesus came only for sinners. Jesus came to give himself only for sinners, which means that he came for you and he came for me. He came so that you could be one of his. He came because he loves you. Paul makes it so clear that that Jesus came, he says, not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. He didn't come for friends. He came for those who were his enemies. He didn't come for those who were worthy of his love or who one day would, would have some value to him. No, no, Jesus came for those who were by birth, set against him, for even from conception, had lived in hostility to him. Paul says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You let those words penetrate your heart and your mind. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if he he dies for sinners, if he dies for those who who are unworthy of his love, those who have fallen short of the glory that he demands, if he dies for those who are born blind, to his truth, and and dead to spiritual life, and enemies of God and, and God's will. That means he died for me. That means he died for you. Long before you could ever ask him to, long before you could have ever earned the love that he has shown, long before you would even think to ask or or to seek it out, Christ came and died for you. It, it, it brings to mind that, that wonderful Christmas hymn that we sing, not every Christmas season, but most Christmas seasons. It's it, the hymn by a, a guy named Yaroslav Vaida. It's a really strange looking name, but, but a wonderful hymn. Where shepherds lately knelt and kept the angel's word. You know, where those shepherds had come to see the Christ child in his manger. Where shepherds lately knelt to keep and keep the angel's word, I come in half belief, a pilgrim strangely stirred, but there's room and welcome there for me. There's room and welcome there for me, right? That's why we sing it. It's that last verse of, of that wonderful hymn that just captures our hearts and our attention, especially when we think of, of, of Jesus dying for the unrighteous. Vita writes, um, can I, will I forget how love was born and burned its way into my heart unasked, unforced, unearned? To live, to die, and not alone for me, he says. To live, to die, and not alone for me. Kind of important to keep that not alone for me part there when we're rejoicing in this fact that, that Jesus came for me. Because maybe, maybe your problem, like mine, is sometimes that, that we're not so much like the woman at the well. 
we're more like those closed-minded or, or narrow-minded, short-sighted disciples who think, oh, of course Jesus is for me, but maybe he's only for me. If that's the thought, then, then we really have to look at what Jesus is doing and, and how he does it. He had to go through Samaria. He had to go there off that regular path, that comfortable path, and far away from everybody he had ever known and all those he would normally feel comfortable with. He had to go here to Samaria for her, for them. If the season of Lent is a wonderful reminder that Jesus came only for sinners, then it also has to be a wonderful reminder that Jesus came for all sinners, not just those we might feel comfortable with, not just those that we might feel comfortable being around, but even for those sinners we might not particularly like, even for those sinners who might not particularly like us either. Do you notice how how beautiful it is. I, what a wonderful example Jesus is for us in how to, how to talk to people about him. You know, Jesus, as he begins there, he talks about, we would say, Jesus just begins the conversation talking about mundane things, you know. That, that word mundane just literally means worldly. Just regular, everyday, common needs. But then Jesus, he he turns that conversation from the mundane, the worldly, to the spiritual, doesn't he? He gets to the heart of the matter so that he can speak to her about him. See, Jesus didn't wait around for the lost to come to him. He didn't wait until we were fully ready and committed to him. No, he died for us. He died for sinners when we were at our worst. Paul says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, someone who's seen to be right. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die, you know, someone who's, who's doing right things, good and helpful things. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if, if he was willing to suffer so when we were at our worst, when we were unlovable, how much more then, how much love and care must he have for us now? Now that he has washed away our, our guilt and our sin, now that he's given us a new heart to love and serve him, now that he's made us brothers and sisters, part of his body here on earth, over whom he rules and watches out and provides, how much greater must his love for us be now? And, in, and if you think about it this way, how great must his love be for those who are still lost? those that still need to be found, those that still need to hear this word, how great must his love for those lost ones be and how great must his desire be that they be found and not just, not just mysteriously found out there but be found by us. Walking around with his word on our lips and the message of his cross being shown in our lives that others might be brought into this, this fellowship. They might be brought with us to be children of our Heavenly Father. Take this as the, as the encouragement this, this Lenten and Easter season to, to love the people around you. Invite them to come join us for worship during Holy Week. Love them so that they can come and and hear of the one who died for them. That they can be like that whole town of Sychar coming to the woman, saying, nah, we, we don't just believe in him because you said some things. Now, now we've heard it for ourselves. Now we know. 
this is the Savior of the world, so this means He is my Savior. There Jesus was, tired and thirsty, but He had come to Sychar to find this woman because she needed Him. A town needed Him and He called her home to Himself so that she could be one of His. May God bless us with the knowledge that our sins are forgiven so that we are His. May He also give us a love like His for the lost. And may we continue to pray that prayer of the day. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways. Bring them with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, of your love, and of your Son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.